welcome uh, former governor and our congressman from the first district of South Carolina, Mark Sanford. We really appreciate you coming to NGCOA today. Pleasure. Uh, so the first district includes everything from Charleston down to Hilton Head, and there's a lot, a lot of great golf courses in, in, in this district. So you, you're probably aware of the, the economic impact of, of golf courses to the community, to the, the economy, and so forth. What, what's your personal connection to the game or the industry of golf? I'd say at a couple different levels. Um, one is we actually go below Hilton Head. You know, you got Hague Point down on Defusky, and you've got uh, you know the courses over on Palmetto Bluff, um, and 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 so, I mean, you well, essentially almost get down to the Savannah River in terms of the lower end of the district. Um, I think that my tie to golf is several fold. One, I'm a really really wretched golfer and so uh, I, I it becomes an easter egg hunt for me when you go golfing uh can i find uh, balls not only the the ones i put in the woods but uh, a few folks others um so you know I, I do a regular easter egg hunt when anytime i go um and there's a fair amount of uh, uh elation or frustration depending on the shot that goes with that uh, but at a professional level um Back when I was governor, it's amazing to me the number of business executives who will come into the coast of South Carolina, not just for fine food, not for great industrial sites, but also for the fact that they can compare notes with, with folks that they work with mm -hmm. or a prospect on the golf course. Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes they put up with my wretched golf simply for the conversation that allows. Mm -hmm. And so. So I'd say that's the second bite at the apple. And the third bite at the apple is if one loves the coast of South Carolina, part of the, the artistic um, nuance uh, that we love, the different look and feel that we love of the low country, is indeed tied to places like Harbor Town or tied mm -hmm. to the ocean course out of Hilton Head, wherein the, the beauty of this part of the world is captured incredibly well by golf course architects. Um, from around the world. We've had some fantastic uh, tournaments in, in this district with mm -hmm. uh, the Heritage down in Hilton Head and the, the PGA Which is a whole different phenomenon. Yeah. I don't even know that I'd call it a golf tournament because <laughs> it, it is one of South Carolina's finest social events. Yeah. And if you want to catch up with folks, I mean, it's been a pilgrimage for me ever since high school going back to the Heritage where you literally catch up with people you'll see once a year and people will come back to that, you know, island you know, just for the heritage and then they're gone the rest of the year. It's, it's a spectacular rite of passage in the spring of South Carolina every year. You're right. You know, and, and I, I write and talk a lot about how golf gets a bad rap from folks that don't get it, don't understand it. They criticize it for, for some justification, but a lot of it is mis, misplaced. But th what they don't understand is the value of spending four to five hours on a golf course with someone getting to know them. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't get to do that even over dinner together. Right. You know, and so there's there's great value in that and we, we have a lot of it in South Carolina. But let me ask you about a few issues, some public policy issues mm -hmm. impacting our industry. Some of it is uh, in Capitol Hill mm -hmm. and so forth. But uh, one particular issue that's uh, of importance to a lot of our folks is the H two B visa um, uh, worker program. So you know, the federal government sets a cap as how many are allowed into the country to work seasonally, temporarily, mm -hmm. and a lot of golf courses avail themselves of it and need that labor. And until this year, the returning workers were exempted from that cap. Mm -hmm. So if they had been reliable, some of these folks become family to mm -hmm. a lot of these operations, they were no longer exempted from the cap. And so there's been a lot of struggle among golf courses this past year. What's, what's your take on this? Because sometimes it feels like it's an immigration issue, but it's really not. It's much more of a labor issue than it is about folks coming and living in the country. Correct. What's your take on this, knowing how important this really is to the golf, a lot of golf courses? Uh, you know, I would fit in you know, what Churchill said, would, which was the, the beauty of the American political system is it always does the right thing, comma, after it's exhausted every other possible remedy. <laughs> and I think that this is one of those issues that has been perplexing to a lot of business owners that I've talked to. Not, not just on the golf course side, but frankly on the hotel side yeah. and other, uh, wherein they've been really, really terribly hit as a result of what happened. And I think this is one of those issues that has enough heat around it that it's going to get fixed. But, but again, we're going to have to manage through probably another season before it gets fixed on a permanent basis. 
Um, there's legislation to that effect. Mm -hmm. I've gone on a letter with Andy Harris. I've been working with Lindsey Graham and others in the congressional delegation in terms of trying to enact something more permanent. Because if not, you go through this sort of annual ritual of trying to get yeah. the, the cap number up. It's set arbitrarily at 66,000. That's not a realistic number. That gets filled within moments, literally. And then we had this annual charade uh, wherein we go and lift the number, but, but it is just that. And so given golf's impact, given hotel impact, y given the size of the economic um, quotient that goes with what's happening with this labor force, I think that it's something good, that's going to change, but it's not going to change in, in, in this particular, you know, cycle that we've got up between here and December, I don't, I don't believe, at least on a permanent basis. It'll get, again, right. nudged temporarily, but I don't think it'll get changed permanently, mm -hmm. uh, probably till, you know, maybe next year, maybe year after. One of the newer requirements of the law, I believe, is that local businesses have to prove the, a negative effect without those workers. It's the, the, so to prove a negative like that is, is a very difficult burden you know, to, to do for, the, for these For anybody businesses. in yeah. the court of law, yeah. uh, in the world of economics, proving a negative is putting somebody in no man's right. land. So I've had, again, very interesting conversations with a number of golf course owners where they're saying, this is absurd. It's a standard that doesn't apply to the rest of folks that are impacted by government on a daily basis. So let's I'll ask you a question about tax reform. There have been talks for, for years about major tax reform in Congress. What's your outlook on major tax reform, and what would you see as necessarily good change for small businesses in major tax reform? I'd say one, I, you know, I'm oddly enough I'm fairly optimistic that something's going to happen on tax reform. And I say that from both a policy and a political standpoint. So the politics are that health care didn't go through, whether one could argue that should or shouldn't have gone through first. It's a very difficult issue if you try and get your arms around health care. There's a lot of emotion that goes with it. When people talk about a loved one having a terminal illness or having cancer, um, there is a lot of emotion that goes with it that doesn't come with the emotion you would anticipate as a consequence of what's on your W-2 or your right. 1099. Um, and so health care went down. It's too big an issue not to come back up. It'll come back up, but it's not going to come up now. What's up next is tax reform. And so from a policy standpoint, it needs to happen in terms of competitiveness in it, of our country relative to a lot of other places around the globe. But now from a political standpoint, something has to happen because the Republican base is exercised. They're like, wait a minute. We gave you the keys to the car. We gave you the House, the Senate, and the White House, and you didn't get health care done. If, they, if we don't get tax reform done, I think there's a significant consequence mm -hmm. in terms of 2018 electoral politics. Mm -hmm. And so I think from both a policy standpoint and a political standpoint, you're going to see movement on this, I suspect, by end of year. Um, I would say that one of the other things that I think gives me hope is that one of the big controversies was the border adjustment tax. It was built into what was proposed on tax reform. It was a, sort of a de facto value-added tax of about 20 percent, and it was a stumbling block. Mm -hmm. uh, I was opposed to it. A number of other folks were opposed to it. Uh, long story short, there was enough noise out there for that to be pulled out. So what the Speaker of the House has now said is, we're moving forward, and we're moving forward without the border adjustment tax. Mm. What that means as a practical matter is that Republicans are now united in a way that they weren't on health care in moving a, a bill forward. So I think that something's going to happen. What's it mean? I think at an individual level and a small business LLC partnership level, you're going to see a collapsing of rates down to three. I think that the, the, the cuts to the marginal rate won't be as robust as people had originally hoped because some of the pay for was mm -hmm. things like the border adjustment tax. Um, I don't think that you'll see full expensing. It's very costly. I think you'll see depreciation left in place and some of the deducts that are in place now in place uh, rather than elimination of all those for full expensing. Um, but I think something's going to happen. Again, I think it'll be a little bit more moderate than what was talked about by Trump on the campaign trail mm -hmm. or by you know Chairman Brady, head of Ways and Means in the House. Mm -hmm. 
So you mentioned healthcare. It's hard to read the tea leaves on what's going to happen with healthcare in the future for the short term or the long term. What would you advise uh, a small business to do to prepare for whatever changes might come, good or bad? Uh, um, I mean, <laughs> trying to read tea leaves. Um, I would say again, I think that something will happen. I don't think something will happen this year. Uh, I think at best it's next year, but the problem with next year is it's an election year. And again, all the things that tripped up health care in this year are going to be even more alive next year. So I would suspect it's something that, that's, that's moved back um, till after the 2018 elections. I could be wrong. Um, maybe something like Lindsey Graham's bill, which is a Cassidy bill that uh, basically says let's move block grants back to states. Maybe there's movement on something like that next year, but I'd give it at best 50-50 odds. So what I would say is I would prepare for at least the next 24 months to contend with what you've been contending okay. with because I don't think it's going to change. I appreciate that. Um, so there's a fundamental issue in Washington as it relates to the golf industry. And it has to do with what I would call the Rodney Dangerfield syndrome that we, that we get no respect, mm -hmm. comparatively. And let me bring you back like 40, 50 years. So in the tax code, back in the 70s, golf was identified on a list of other, of, with other industries, it's called the sin list. It's casinos, massage parlors, tanning salons, and golf was in there. Some, it's buried down in the bowels of the tax code. Somehow it's been a refrain in, in Washington that when we need to pay for or we need to exempt some industries out of a certain tax relief or disaster relief funding, mm -hmm. golf gets lumped in there. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to figure out how to, to extract golf from that and, and educate Washington on what our contributions are, that we are small businesses, mm -hmm. not unlike hotels or restaurants or amusement parks or whatever it might be. One example this last year was when that water crisis in Flint was happening. Uh, one of the senators from Michigan was trying to raise some funds to pay for, I suppose, some fixes. And the pay for was going to be to take golf out of qualification for any conservation easements. Mm -hmm. That golf is not deserving of it. And we were able to fight back and say, no, you don't understand, you know, what golf's contributions are and that this land it actually qualifies. So, but we're fighting those battles all the time. So what would you advise our industry leaders as the most effective way besides the, the ongoing education that we're trying to do uh, to educate Washington mm -hmm. on golf's contributions and that, you know, the nature of the business of golf. I guess it was Jefferson who said that eternal vigilance was the price of liberty. And in that regard, what I'd say is it's the squeaky wheels that get grease in politics, but one has to be rather eternally vigilant in making your case because there are a lot of supplicants before you know the halls of Washington and saying this is this is my case let me tell you my story and I, I don't think that that advocacy uh, ever ends from any side any interest group and therefore it's just rolling your sleeves up continue to go out and tell your story I think that there's a compelling story to be told but you know if a tree falls in the forest but nobody's there to hear it it didn't make any noise and it's awfully important from a business standpoint that people take the time to engage with their rep and say, let me tell you my story on why this is so important. Because if not, it gets viewed as sort of an exclusive sport. It's something you see in resort areas. But in fact, golf permeates our country. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, 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 you know, one of the best lobbying groups I've ever seen, well, there are two great lobbying groups. One is APAC, which is the, uh, the lobby for Israel. You know, it's broken down on, a, uh, on almost a precinct level in terms of their level of engagement with their representatives. Same thing happens with the NRA, almost down to the precinct level. And I would just encourage folks to say, let's be strategic about thinking about how we, you know, get a golf course owner who happens to have a place in a lot of these smaller hamlets and towns across this country to make their case to the local congressman as well as a place like the coast of South Carolina mm -hmm. where it's the land of plenty when it comes to golf courses. I'd say our industry is only 10 years into serious advocacy work and it all started with Hurricane Katrina 
and when uh, the, the relief bill came out for, for tax relief, the golf courses were excluded, and that was a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. and so now we've, we're, we're fairly well organized, and, we're, and I think we're just now starting to see Washington understand our story, but sure. you're right, we, we, we can't stop. We yeah. got, we've got to always tell that story. Uh, so when can we get you out for an Easter egg hunt on that golf course? I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, um, I love summer. Summer's ending. So what I'd have to say is we'll have to wait till next summer. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate all the work that you do for small businesses and golf courses in particular. My pleasure.